I'm going to go with the, uh, try to paint that pot in the bottom here. If I have time, I'll, I'll move on to this skull as well. And, um, you yeah, know, we have a pretty large painting here that we're working on this time around. And um, so it's coming along. Uh, I just started um, yesterday. So yesterday we did this um, pot here. And uh, yeah, coming along fairly well. And then um, worked on this globe up here um, today, like this afternoon. And then, so right now we're just gonna go to this little pot here. And then we go back into that into that globe we'll see what happens I don't know if I can that's probably better just like that so yeah I'll just start here and uh, see how far we get I'm just gonna go with three different colors. Well, not even really three different colors. I'm gonna go with blue. And uh, blue and white together, so a tint of blue. And this is ultramarine blue. And then uh, and I'm gonna go with black as well. So I'm just gonna see how that goes. So this pot here, looking for um, some lighter areas at first. I'm gonna drop those in. Um, this is a, a flat brush, by the way. I think it's a number. Four, it's a number ten. So pretty, pretty big brush by my standards. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's kind of keeping things a little loose at this point. I'm just doing a little uh, metal jar here, and uh, so I'm gonna go with just kind of painting everything in reverse here. I'm painting in the the highlights first, kind of making these indications where I think there may be highlights. Well, thanks so much. Um, it's uh, it's oil. It's an oil painting. Yeah. yeah I don't uh, I don't really paint in acrylic anymore. I was painting in acrylic uh, in art school, and then just because we weren't allowed to paint with oil, that they had bad ventilation, and then um, you know, as I I just kind of slowly transitioned out of acrylic. I I was using acrylic as underpaintings for a while. And, uh, and then I just kind of finally gave it up. Okay, so let's let's kind of stop that there. I'm gonna go with a little bit of blue now, just kind of around those those white edges. I'm keeping things fairly wet, you can see. There's a lot of fluidity in the paint at this point. I, uh, I am going to go back into all of these parts in a few moments and put in some detail. But uh, it, it's enough for now just to kind of map out the different areas. Uh, yeah, I prefer oil too, for sure. Yeah, it's much easier to work with. Fly Fisherman, thanks for your tutorials. Thank you so much for uh, for doing them and um, for taking part. I uh, I really like hearing when um, people are trying them out and getting something from them. So yeah, thanks so much.
I, uh, I have fun making them too. Uh, I always think that if you if you have enough time, you can draw anything, but you know, it's, there's a there's more of a challenge to try to um, distill the the object, whatever it is, into its kind of basic shapes. So, yeah, I've had a lot of fun with that. This is just black and uh, white and ultramarine blue. How do I blend so well? Um, so, oh, oh um, Miss Helly, thank you so much for the seven roses. That's really awesome. Millionaire, uh, yeah, I do have uh, YouTube. I have, um, it's Mark Liam Smith, same uh, name as my TikTok name. Um, all my social media, in fact. And um, yeah, my YouTube is is basically like how to paint for, for new painters. So uh, if you're interested in painting, um, I have everything on there from like, you know, the differences between um, canvas and linen and paper. Uh, I talk about all the different kinds of brushes. I talk about some color reviews, color theory. Um, two weeks ago I did scumbling. This week I'm doing glazing. I'm actually releasing it tomorrow. Uh, yeah, just painting techniques, application techniques, color theory, just the whole thing. Anything you might want to know about painting, um, that's my YouTube channel. I just, I just started it, so I only have like a thousand subs. So, uh, yeah, I'd, uh, certainly appreciate the, the support. How do I blend so well? Um, yeah, blending is, it's to do with the, um, how, how liquid your oil paint is. So if you're, if you're have, having trouble blending, then, um, it might not, you might not have enough, um, uh, oil. That's a possibility. That's kind of the, the first thing I would check. Um, it's always good to have kind of a little extra tub of linseed oil off on the side and that you can dip into, you know, and you need that anyway because some paint is opaque and some is transparent. So if you are, um, let's say you're glazing and uh, you can glaze transparent paint like right out of the tube if you want to, but if you try to glaze an opaque paint, it, it won't work because glazing has to be with transparent paint. So you're gonna need that little tub anyway. Yeah, you can uh, give that a shot. I'm just gonna soften these edges. Advice for left-handed folk? Um, I don't know. Uh, is there a difference in painting for left or right-handed people? Um, the I don't know if it's true or not, but left-handed people are supposed to be more creative. So I, mean, I think if you're left-handed, you should be giving out the advice. But uh, no, I don't know. I've never heard if... Uh, there being a difference. Paintbrushes are cylindrical, so I don't think they favor either hand. Um, I Oh, actually, you know, just thinking about it, I think I do have a bit of advice for left-handed folk that is slightly different than right-handed. So um, if you're the kind of painter that doesn't paint the whole canvas all at once, like you're supposed to, like I don't, I, I paint just sections, you're not really supposed to, but I, that's fine, I, I don't care. Um, but if you paint from one section to another, 
section like I do, then uh, if you start in the if you're left-handed and you start in the top right and work toward the bottom left, um, that would be probably the easiest way to do it for you, because then you can rest your hand on the canvas. So yeah, there you go. That's some advice. And if you're right-handed, it's the opposite. You should start top left and work across to the bottom right. Yeah, you're welcome. I, uh, I've never thought about that before. I guess it makes sense. Uh, it would, I think it would certainly come into play more with drawing. Because with drawing, you tend to rest your hand on the paper a little bit more. And, and your hand has a lot of oils in it. I mean, I don't, I don't know what your specific hand is like, but one's hand has oils. forward to doing this skull. There are actually going to be two skulls in this uh, in this painting, which is just cool for me because I like painting skulls. Thank you so much for the shares. Appreciate that. Does the painting have a story? Yeah, uh, so this is kind of the culmination of uh, all of the different uh, still life paintings that I've been doing in the Dutch and Flemish tradition. And uh, and to that end, I'm, I'm painting a whole bunch of different still lives, um, you know, flowers and fruit and insects and just everything uh, in that tradition, that same tradition. So this particular painting is uh, kind of everything all, all thrown together. And um, I think that speaks to uh, the opulence that was there uh, kind of Europe, in Europe at, in the 1700s. Um, so, you know, the whole series generally is about recontextualizing and kind of repurposing history and uh, to uh, focus on uh, uh, maybe our own narratives, how, how we fit history into uh, the everyday. How can we grapple with some uh, historical decisions? So I think... Uh, since I, I repurpose a lot of these art historical tropes and I recontextualize them. I think uh, that's, that's kind of that's where I'm going there with the story. So this one in particular is that grand narrative that uh, I was kind of referring to earlier. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, yeah, this one's here. I'll just back up a little bit and show you. This one's going to be huge. So, um, we started with this yesterday, uh, on the live yesterday. And um, this globe did uh, this afternoon. So, it's going to be cool. This whole thing, this whole painting is going to be this giant table just full of fruit and books and skulls and all kinds of things so yeah it should be it should be pretty wild uh, when I first started was shading a difficult thing to wrap your head around yeah yeah it was because when I first started drawing um, like shading is a drawing concept 
um, when I first started drawing, I, I started because of comic books and, uh, you know, shading wasn't really a thing that I had to worry about. I was more focused on anatomy and proportions and costuming and things like that. So, um, yeah, I just, it was just something that I had to do. I had to get done. But, um, as I kept drawing, it, it would always seem to, uh, seemed to be more and more important and it would kind of sink my drawings if I didn't get it right. So yeah, I did have to, certainly had to put some time toward it. I think that's fair to say. The globe is insane, so my great-great-granddads will be looking at your art hanging in the gallery. <laughs> uh, thank you, that's that's very nice. Um, I am i don't know about that. Um, if your great-great-granddad is alive, or uh, grandkids, um, if you have uh, great-great-grandkids that are alive right now, they can see my art hanging in a gallery in Montreal in December. Um, that's the only guarantee there is. I have a show coming up in uh, December at Gallery Yoon. But uh, other than that, I think that's that's all that's all that we're guaranteed these days. But uh, thank you, that's a really nice sentiment. I think I can probably just go for that smaller brush at this point. I'm getting to that point where I'm struggling for the size of the brush, so and I'm painting with a 10 right now. I could certainly Oh, thanks uh, Lance Wolf for those pandas. Very much appreciated. Chicken noodles, thank you. Holy Crusader, how does one, how does getting your art in galleries work? Uh, yeah, that's tough. So I, I don't know whether my journey was normal or not, but um, I kind of, I think I went sort of a long way around. So I've been painting professionally um, for six years. Like by professionally, I mean showing in galleries. Um, and... Uh, so for me, I would go on a website called Akimbo and it would have these open calls and, and they're kind of like competitions. And um, sometimes you have to pay like an application fee or something. And the ones that would make you pay a hanging fee, I would never do um, just because I, I just kind of thought those were ripoffs. But um, I didn't mind paying an application fee to apply for these contests. And then um, and then if you win the contest, then you'd get to exhibit your work. So I did that to kind of build up my um, my exhibition history, because I had I had nothing. Like six years ago, I had no shows whatsoever. No, no group shows, no solo shows, nothing. Um, so I did that and I got into a few shows and uh, had a few very small exhibitions like they were all group shows and I'd get one piece in the group show but it's still it's enough to get your name you can put your name on you can say you were in that show or whatever so um yeah I did that and I got on I got into a few different shows that way 
which was really cool. And then I won a competition, a portrait competition. And I got to show my work in New York City at a really good gallery in the art section called Chelsea in Manhattan. And because of that, I got to take my work to um, Basel in Switzerland that same year. And I'd only been painting for about a year at that point. And um, yeah, so I just things just kind of really sped up from there. And then I got a right after that, I got a Toronto dealer to uh, represent me. And then that happened for a little bit. I had one solo show with that gallery. And then they, uh, they started getting really um, picky about what they wanted me to show and what they wanted me to make and like the sizes and the things and stuff. And I just, so that didn't really work out, but I ended up getting another gallery um, because I, I saw the gallerist in, at an, at an art opening and I went and introduced myself and asked him if he would like to do a studio visit and come to my studio. And he did come to my studio and then he, you know, he, he, I guess he liked my work enough that he said he would put, uh, he would put one painting in a group show he was having and they, um, so I, I sent so he wanted two paintings. He wanted two very, very small paintings. Like, uh, it was like a little Christmas show. And so I gave him the two paintings. I put them on Instagram, actually. But I tagged his gallery and said, these are going to be in the in this little Christmas show. Um, please contact the gallery if you're interested. And, um, and then they both sold. And that was like four days before the opening. So he said, hey, um, those both sold. Can you bring two more? Um, and then And then I did. Brought two more. And then both of those sold on the opening night. So he said, okay, this, this is cool. Um, can you give me a big one? I'm having another group show in a few months. And then I did that. And then that sold. And it was a really big one. It was like six feet. Um, six feet tall and four feet wide. And, uh, and then after that sold, then he signed me. So, and I've had three solo shows with him now. And it's been five years. So, and actually this painting is going in that show in December. It's at uh, Gallery Yoon in Montreal. So. That's kind of how I got started. Can you have my hands? <laughs> um, uh, well, I'm still using them, but... Um, you can, you can develop your own hands. So I'm just using two, um, well, not even two colors here. I'm just using, uh, I guess you could say one color. It's just blue. And then I'm also using black and white. Yeah, realism's fun. You've been trying photorealism? Yeah, photorealism's tough. It's a very different thing than, than realism. So, like, I'm not a photorealist. I'm a, I'm a realist. And the difference between realism and photorealism is that with realism, there's a point where you get close enough that the illusion breaks. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing starts... The thing just looks like a painting. Like, you can see the brush strokes and doesn't look like the thing anymore, whether it's porcelain or wood or whatever. Um, with photorealism, it, the illusion does not break. It doesn't matter how close you get. So the difference in time that it takes is so huge. 
uh, if, to, to do photorealism and, and hyperrealism as well. So same idea. It's even more so with hyperrealism because you're painting things that aren't actually there. You're painting details that you think should be there. Um, yeah, it's really, really insane, really wild. Yeah, you do have to remove the artist's I Well, you try to, but what you'll find is it's impossible. Like, if you look at some photorealists, um, if you study photorealism, like, just look at uh, photorealism in history. You know, like, uh, let's say, look at Richard Beckman, and look at uh, some early Chuck Close work, look at uh, Richard Estes. So even though they're all f amazing photorealists, and, and their goal was the same goal that you have is to remove the artist uh, you can still tell who is who so you can't actually remove the artist I don't think you're still gonna have you have to make color choices you have to make decisions even if you're trying to be completely faithful to the process you have to make decisions and those decisions if you make them repetitively um, you know, across different paintings, the same kinds of decisions. It's, uh, that's, that's like an MO. So you, uh, you reveal yourself through your methodology. Uh, you know, and that's not a bad thing. So, um, if you are going to do photorealism, though, you will need extraordinary patience. Or you're going to develop it. Um, I'm not a photorealist, I'm a realist, and some paintings I, I do take four months. So if you're, if you want to go to photorealism, you, you know, you have to be prepared to spend much, much longer than that, even. Um, very famous photorealist of floral painting in the Dutch era, a woman named Rachel Reich, she painted uh, only two paintings per year because they were so detailed. So, you, uh, and they're not, they weren't even really that big either. They were, you know, like 30 inches by 40 inches kind of thing. So, it's, uh, it's tough being a photorealist if, when you're just starting out, though. Because what happens is you, you're going to spend a month or two months even on a single painting, and then, um, but that's all your time locked up, right? And so if they don't sell, uh, it's not like you're some kind of abstract painter that you can paint seven paintings in a day. You know? So you have to really hope that all your paintings sell. Otherwise, you could be in trouble financially. Oh, thanks so much for the uh, amazing. That's one of the, the main features of painting um, metals and uh, or, or um, ceramics, things that are really shiny. One of the main features is you go from very, very bright to very, very dark. And uh, so that's, that's called uh, the difference in uh, value. Value is how light and how dark something is. And um, it's actually a trick of the brain. So you're tricking the audience brain here. What happens is the audience looks at something and, and uh, that thing um, should be all one color. That's what the audience's brain is saying. They want it to all be one color. 
So by having some things very light and some things very dark, uh, what happens? The, the brain just says, okay, that must be a condition of the lighting. And then it makes you think that, uh, that it's just lighting instead of the, the object being different colors. It's a pretty wild effect. It's almost like a optical illusion or something. Almost. What are my opinions on abstract art? Um, abstract art is the hardest and the easiest form of painting. It's the easiest form because you you can, as long as you, you're applying paint to canvas, you can you will have something that you can call abstract. Uh, it's the hardest form of painting because you have no other things to rely on. You can't create a narrative. Uh, you have you, you have to create you have to evoke emotions through color and texture and shape alone. Um, you you're taking all of the tools out of your toolbox except for just a few. So uh, in order to to create emotional paintings and to do it consistently, uh, you have you have to really know painting well. You have to know what color relationships, color harmonies do to the emotion. Um, you have to, there's just so much there that needs to be examined. So, and that's hard. It's really hard. So I would, that's why I say it's, it's both the hardest and the easiest form of art. Uh, I have a lot of respect for uh, abstract painters. I, I know uh, a few, I have a, f I, and I own a few in my collection, a few abstract paintings. Um, they are, the people that do it well are really, really talented painters. I don't, uh, I have no hate for abstract painting whatsoever. Do I have uh, do I have that item to look at? Um, you know, so so what I do is I I um, draw everything out based like I make the image on Photoshop, and then I draw everything out, and then I have um, then I just color them in from memory or, or from the lighting and so on. So I don't no I don't physically have this object. I'm just creating the colors as I'm going along. Oh, thank you so much. Um, you got hooked on seeing someone do water drops, and you're stunned. Uh, Annette Bingham, I have a uh, tutorial on TikTok for how to paint water drops, and it's a lot easier than you might think. So if you're interested, uh, yeah, I'd, I will direct your attention to that tutorial. Um, I should say, by the way, since I'm, I just said to direct your attention, I, sh I should, uh, I should try to direct your attention here. Um, I just launched an online store five days ago, and so if you're thinking about getting an art present or something for, maybe for the holidays, um, yeah, please consider my art. I have thirty-two different prints of my paintings, and I've printed them exactly the same size as my paintings. Um, and they're, they go from 25 bucks up to, up to 40 bucks. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love for you guys to check it out. It's at, uh, the link is in the bio. You can just click shop, um, poster prints, uh, or go to markliamsmith.com. So if you're interested, uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. I'll just pull back here now and uh, you can see what I'm working on. Here's the, uh, there's the globe that I did, um, 
this afternoon. And then uh, we did this one on, on the live stream yesterday. Did I go to art school? Yeah, I did. I, uh, I went to art school a while ago. I did a BFA, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in uh, Drawing and Painting. Um, but I, the, uh, they didn't have, like, it wasn't a proper art school. It was just a, it was a university with an art department. And so we didn't have, um, uh, ventilation. So I, I didn't, um, I didn't learn oil painting there at that art school. But, uh, but I did learn the principles of painting and, comp and composing and things like that. So I, um, I went to art school and then I, graduated and I didn't do anything with it. Um, I got a different job doing other things. I wore a suit and tie for a while, but I came, just came back to art um, a little while ago. About, uh, well, I've been showing in galleries now for six years. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy to say that it's, it's going well. I've had shows in London, England and Miami, New York. Um, Seattle and Los Angeles, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal. Um, yeah, I've been pretty fortunate with having exhibitions. Yeah, yeah, this is a big one. It says uh, 40 inches. It goes all the way to there. 40 inches by 30 inches. And it's going to be a big table. With just It's just packed full of stuff. Books and skulls and lobsters and fruit bowls and baskets and uh, just, just everything opulent. Um, Jace Craft, how many years did it take to get to this level? Uh, well, I've been painting professionally for six years. So, yeah. Okay, so I think I'm just gonna leave that, leave that one just like that. Maybe just a couple more highlights over here. Um, so this skull, I'm going to go for the skull next. And I was working with, uh, I just did this, this um, globe here uh, this afternoon. So uh, that's just three colors. It's, it's uh, yellow ochre and white and black. So I think I'm just going to go with that, those colors again for this skull down here. And we'll come back to uh, to this if need be. I I don't know. I might glaze another color on top. I I doubt it.
Okay, uh, I'm gonna use the same brush. I, I just, uh, I'd rather just dip it in some linseed oil and wipe it on a rag than dirty another brush. Um, there's no real reason for that other than I'm um, just kind of being lazy about it. This is a 10 flat. It's a really nice brush to use. So uh, yeah, I'll just dip it in this linseed oil, kind of give it a shake and wipe it on this rag. And There we go. So let's move over to the skull. Um, I have it fairly bright. I'm just going to mix up some yellow ochres. Mark out the the lightest areas. So with this, you know, I have the light hitting just from the top and left. So I I, I want to do the same thing with the skull, right? So I was trying to visualize the anatomy now. Um, so this is going to be lit side of the nose here, and then this is. Uh, This bone here uh, beside the eyeball is called a zygomatic arch. And it comes in here, a zygomatic arch. And then just these two areas here. This is a part of the skull called a supraorbital torus. You have to um, pay attention to the anatomy, the underlying anatomy, if, if you want to uh, be able to light it properly from imagination. Over the comments, the comments are covering the painting. Yeah, no problem. Um, getting kind of a glare. Maybe if I aim it down, if I raise the camera, the camera up. It's on a tripod, so it's not that big of a deal. And then... I don't know how distorted that makes it, but... Yeah, I can't really... Uh... I can't really show all of the, all of the painting in at this point. So, yeah, so I'm going to get the side of the nose here. This uh, skull is going to be a little bit on the yellow side, but uh, but that's okay. It'll kind of give it a classic feel. Have to be careful not to have any of that yellow mix with the the blue here. Of 
course that would be green, which is not good for either. Let me just drop in some of the browns now so that I kind of get a better sense. I'm starting to lose the the, the, uh, the objects. So we got the zygomatic arch here coming in. Kind of a nice dip here and by the nose too. side of the head. This will make sense in a few moments. I'm just uh, so basically, since the light's coming from this side, I'm trying to make this side of the head a little less saturated and uh, a little darker too. And then that way, it's gonna it's gonna push back a little bit that way. That's the idea. Uh, paint some details in in a moment but I'm just gonna get the basic shade shading down and kind of um, more subdued on that side and then brighter stuff on that side but, uh, that's one thing about painting is you have to get comfortable with the ugly stages there really are so many of them um, many many more ugly stages than than the other kind. The kind where you'd be happy for somebody to walk into your studio and say, oh, that looks amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, that doesn't happen very much. It's uh, that kind of the comment only comes right at the very end. Uh, it's just, that's the thing, like with enough practice, you kind of know that even though it's an ugly stage at the moment, you're, it's, it's going to be something getting there so Just doing some blending here, blending wet into wet. This is a technique called Alla Prima, and uh, it's quite an effective technique with oil paint. Not so effective uh, with with acrylic because the acrylic tends to dry before you can really get any bl good blending in.
trying to create that rounded effect here by uh, having the lighter areas closer and the darker areas fall. I should really uh, not paint two different colors like this right beside each other. I should just should have gone to a different part of the painting and um, done that one first. Because I don't, I don't want to mix these. A genuine demonstration of the process yeah yeah this is uh, I agree I, I guess um, it's something that it's one of those things that when you paint all the time you don't really think about it being something that people might be interested in watching um, but uh, yeah just uh, a lot of the blending Lots of yellows and grays and things in here that uh, I'll probably just end up leaving in. something over that eye there. Vinti Cat, I need to learn how to blend with acrylic paint. Yeah, if you're having trouble blending with acrylic paint, um, it's probably because the paint's drying too quickly. So um, you can buy something, a slow drying agent, and you mix it in with your acrylic paint, and then it doesn't dry quite as quickly. And then you'll have an easier time blending. Have I painted animals before? Yeah, I have. Um, I've only ever painted animals for commissions. And um, so when I started out, I, I did quite a lot of commissions. So I painted horses and things like that. But um, 
I guess in my next show I have I have an animal. I have a, a snake fighting a mongoose um, in one of my paintings. And let me see. Oh, I paint, I paint a lot of uh, sea animals. Like I have, in my next show I have a, a, blue, a blue lobster uh, painting. I don't know if you were thinking about sea animals when you said animals, but but yeah, no, I, I, I don't do pet portraits or anything like that anymore. Um, you know, I would. I do, uh, can always find time to, to make a painting in the schedule. Got a lot done since you last hopped on the live. Yeah, I'll just uh, pull back and show you what we did so far. So we have, um, that was yesterday's live. We did this pot here. Um, and then, uh, so that was last night, two hours or something. And then this afternoon, we did this one on the live this afternoon. And then, so right now, this is uh, today's live right now. So, yeah, coming along, coming along. Yeah, the blue lobster. Um, this this painting that I'm doing right now is just uh, it's a table. It's just packed full of things, like you, you name it. It's it's in this table, books and uh, uh, like. A plate full of oysters, uh, a turkey, uh, just just everything. Everything's in this painting. So, um, yeah, I have th actually three lobsters, I think, in this painting. So, I might make another one of them blue. But uh, there's also that yellow lobster that I was uh, researching. It looks so cool. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, I, I just finished a painting of a lobster. Uh, but it was a blue lobster, which is a one in two million chance of finding one of these things. But it's not even close to being the rarest lobster. There's another one. It's a yellow lobster. And there's one in 30 million for that one. It's it's something about a mutation, a genetic mutation in their proteins that give them their color. So this one is yellow. But then that's even one in 30 million is not the rarest. There's another lobster called the crystal lobster and I highly highly encourage you to google it it is amazing so the crystal lobster is a one in a hundred million lobster and uh, it's clear it's see-through and you gotta check you gotta see the photos of this thing it's just so beautiful hauntingly beautiful right it's, like, it's just so unnatural seeing a clear lobster yeah, really wild stuff. Anyway, I didn't paint the clear lobster because I just, it was just too different. I, I, people wouldn't know what I was trying to get, get at. I think they can relate to a blue lobster. It's like, oh, that's a lobster, but it's blue. But the clear lobster was a little different because you could, you know, you could see inside. Probably just wait for a smaller brush for this line here, but okay, I didn't wait. That's fine. Just go for it.
Uh, yeah, yeah, this is realism. So with realism, you're not trying to get, um, like, it's a, it's supposed to be an illusion at a certain distance, like, you know, that distance. But then when you get close, you can see all the brush strokes. That's, that's the idea with realism. If I was trying to do just a complete replica, that wouldn't be realism. That would just be um, photorealism, which I think is a completely different skill set. With realism, you're always thinking about the, the forms, the underlying forms, and how, how you can abstract them down to simple, simpler forms. But with photorealism, it's just about the technique of, of um, rendering the colors perfectly. Uh, I, I could never be a photorealist because I'm colorblind. So there's just no chance that I can, I would be able to get the right colors. But um, no, realism is good. I, I, I like showing the, the hand of the artist. Um, I think it's uh, it's a good thing. Tina Dunnert, thank you for so much for the rose. Does anyone know what the squares are for? Um, I do. I know what they're for. It's uh, it, there's a it's the technique that I'm doing is called the uh, grid technique. So that those squares are a grid. It's a one inch by one inch grid. You can have any size you like for the grid. Um, and then so what I do is I I plan my painting out beforehand. Some people do it on paper and some people do it on Photoshop. Uh, I do mine on Photoshop. I plan it out and then I draw a grid and then with a white pencil, I draw, here you can see, you can see these outlines? I draw like that with a white pencil. So that's a plate of oysters and that's a lemon. And then from there I color it in. So that's, the grid helps me just uh, keep every all the proportions right it's a really really old technique it's done it's been done for hundreds of years and uh, there's no shame in it I think uh, some people say oh you shouldn't do the grid or something like that no there's no shame in, in doing the grid da Vinci did a grid you know Vermeer used a projector it's it's uh, there's nothing wrong at all. Yeah, it just it really helps with your proportions. Hazy Galaxy, thank you so much for the cloud bread. The five of them, amazing. I really appreciate that. Tina Donner, thank you for the finger heart. Um, so Jace Craft is asking, what colors can you not see? Uh, so there's no color I can't see. I am red-green colorblind. Um, so I have a condition um, called Daltonism. I'm a, I'm a red-green deuteranope. So what that means is... Um, 
So you have three different cones in, uh, in your retina. You have uh, red, green, and blue. And those three cones put together, just like pixels on a TV, will combine to form all of the possible available colors. But I have a deficiency in the, in the number of red cones and in the number of green cones in my retina. So what that means is there are certain reds and certain greens that I can't see. And typically, those ones I can't see are the greens that are very, very low in chroma or saturation. So if, uh, if a color is particularly bright, vibrant, I have no difficulty seeing it. And that's why I tend to paint in more vivid colors, uh, I think. So, um, you know, I could never mistake lime green for for a, a bluey green or something like a turquoise or anything like that. I, I wouldn't mistake those colors. But if a color is very desaturated, like a olive green, then that could start looking brown or gray very, very easily. So. Do I paint flowers? Uh, yeah, that's all I paint. Um, do uh, just click on my... Uh, um, any, any anything like click on my Facebook, Instagram, go to my website. There's a link in my bio. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I paint. This uh, painting like this, like a still life painting, is by far the exception. Um, I'm uh, I've kind of built built my reputation uh, on all my shows are on around flower painting. Um, so. What I actually do is I paint in the tradition of the Dutch and floral, Dutch and, and uh, Flemish floral traditions of the 1700s. So um, that was mostly floral painting. It's mostly flowers. But there are other things in there like bugs and fruit and things like that. So, But yeah, yeah, I definitely paint a lot of flowers. No, no, I'm not painting flowers at the moment. Um, you're right. This, uh, there are actually very few flowers in this painting, even though it's, it's uh, in a show called Tulip Mania. Um, yeah, there will be few flowers in this one. It's going to be a lot of everything else, though. I think it'll be a really nice counterpoint to all of the flower paintings that I'm that I'm putting in here. Um, oh, nice. Thanks, uh, Jace. You're trying their art tutorials. That's cool. Yeah, I had a lot of fun uh, making those. It's, it's um, Sometimes it's difficult for me to try to figure out the best way to, to break down the shapes. Like, to, you know, starting with a square or a triangle or, uh, you know, in what order to go for it and things like that. So, yeah, I, I really am enjoying the kind of the teaching aspect of it, I guess. Do I have a lot to finish before the show? Um, no, no, I don't. I, I have, um, so this is a question that Infinite Pile um, asked. 
Uh, no. Uh, so I have 18 paintings finished right now. And the show is pretty much ready to go. Uh, this painting that I'm doing right now, I don't know if I'll be able to finish in time. So if I do, it'll be kind of a bonus painting. But uh, yeah, I have I have 18 paintings to go. Um, yeah, by the way, for those of you who are interested in my artwork, who maybe aren't in a position to pick up an original piece, um, I have released prints uh, on my website. And uh, there's a link in the bio, and they range from... 25 bucks up to 40 bucks uh, and I have 32 different paintings and a lot of them will be in my new show in my upcoming show so um, yeah if you're interested at all in in my art and you'd like to support me then um, yeah if you like to check that out and pick up a print that'd be awesome I, uh, the thing about the prints is I made all of the prints exactly the same size as the, as their paintings. So, um, yeah, I have one right here. I'll, I'll show you, by the way. So here's, uh, here's, one, here's what that looks like. This is one of the prints. And so it's, it's a paper. It's pretty matte and durable paper. Um, the painting, the original that I did for this one, uh, I was auctioned off at the Bank of Montreal Kids Help Phone auction this year. And um, that's why it's a blue rose, because the Bank of Montreal's colors are blue. So, um, and it was Kids Help Phone. So what I did is I did uh, caterpillars, and then cocooning, and then into butterflies, and then also like buds blooming into like fully bloom. So like that was kind of, um, uh, that was a metaphor for, for the kids getting help and then being able to bloom. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that auctioned off, the original auctioned off, but the, the prints are available if you're interested, and as well as like 32 other ones. Uh, yeah, so here's what we have so far. We have this uh, nice shiny copper one. Um, Kathleen Weiler, I love the way you paint. Thank you so much. Is your show like a live in-person thing or online? Uh, yeah, it's a live in-person thing. It's in Montreal at a gallery called Gallery Yoon, which is in the Old Port on uh, St. Paul Street. St. Paul and McGill, basically. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big art gallery. And there'll be a reception on Friday, the uh, December 3rd. And then my show runs all the way to the end of January. It's a solo show. Um, almost two months. Does this painting have a meaning like the print you showed? Yeah, yeah, this, so this, this painting is kind of the culmination of all of the, the concepts that I was talking about in, in this show. So uh, this whole show, I'm recontextualizing historical memes and tropes uh, in art history. And uh, so yeah, I'm talking a lot about how we view history and how we, um, reconfigure history in order to justify 
any number of things. So this particular painting is talking about opulence. And um, it's, it's going to be pretty over the top. There's going to be definitely a lot here. I think I should probably paint that other eye. trying to get it to go right to black. Uh, you just finished your first painting? Nice. Congratulations. Welcome to the team. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, feels good to paint. You know, it gets, I think, I think there's something cathartic, maybe, maybe, uh, not therapeutic. I don't want to. I don't want to say that, but I mean, art therapy is a thing. So I don't think even if I did say that, I'd be way off base. But um, yeah, cathartic for sure. A lot of people find that making art every day is, uh, is just good for them, good for their soul, so to speak. Um, You can certainly learn a lot about yourself when you make art. And when you oil paint, you can learn whether you're a patient person or not. It will demand that of you. Do I prefer to be called Mark or Mark Liam? Just Mark. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mark Liam is just more of a formality because I have... Um, there are just so many Smiths. Yeah, anyone who has a Smith as a, as Smith as a last name has to do something else with it, like uh, put an initial or... or, yeah, just do something. So, in, uh, like, official exhibition correspondence and things like that then I always go with Mark Liam but just just people that know me just call me Mark but uh, yeah thanks for asking Smith is popular. Yeah, we're everywhere. Uh, yeah, people can buy my original paintings. So um, thanks for the question, Kudabran. Uh, okay, so let me 
let me tell you all of the different ways and places you can buy my art. Um, so if you want an original painting, I sell paintings through three different galleries. I'm represented by three different galleries. Um, Gallery Yoon in Montreal. You don't have to remember any of this. It's all on my website. But um, Gallery Yoon in Montreal, uh, Rouge Gallery in Western Canada, and 19 Karen in Australia, in the Gold Coast of Australia uh, on Mermaid Beach. It's actually the largest art gallery in uh, Australia. So those, th those where I sell originals those three places and um, then if you want to buy um, limited edition photography prints I have um, those available through a gallery a New York gallery called Treat Gallery and uh, they actually just showed them at the Affordable Art Fair in New York I had uh, I had an edition of 20 I had eight different photographs edition to 20 only and then there's still some available left and um, so those are limited edition photographs um, and that's through Treat Gallery New York and then I also have uh, NFTs available through um, a couple of different NFT marketplaces like the Foundation and Maker's Place and um, open C. All of those links are in my bio as well. And then I, uh, and if you want to buy prints, those are available through my website. And I have prints available for 35 different paintings. So yeah, lots of stuff. Original, original paintings and prints and photographs and NFTs. Here. Have I ever accidentally ruined a finished painting? Uh, yeah, one time I was carrying a really big painting, six feet wide, and I was carrying it, and I don't know how it happened, but I put a hole in the bottom of it. So that was suboptimal. Um, I've lost a painting before. That really was not great. The thing that made it even worse is that I had sold it. And then I lost it. So I, I had to paint it again. But the guy was really cool about it. Am I using oil or acrylic? Yeah, this is oil. This is an oil painting. Uh, fitting, I guess, that I'm painting a skull being so close to Halloween. I'm going to put some, just to paint a few teeth. 
I'm not going to give this. Do you do holiday themed painting? No. No, I don't. I don't have uh, time. I, um, I'd like to be able to do that kind of thing, but uh, no, my my schedule, my show, like what I paint is really, really tight. Um, it's such a, I have a tight schedule based on when my show is and how many paintings I want to get done. I kind of work backwards because I've, I've been painting for a while now, so I have a reasonable idea about how long each size will take. So I kind of plan my show that way. Like I'll get so many of this size and so many of that size and then just make myself a schedule and then just go. Um, so I've been painting this show now for eight months or something like that. Oh, nice. I'm happy to be your first live. Yeah, I, um, TikTok's, um, really, uh, wonderful format in terms of advice I'd say if if you are like they're they're kind of two different style um, t people who use TikTok they're people who create a lot of content and then people who consume a lot of content I would say so if you are um, in the category of people who who create content I guess the only piece of advice that I would give you is that um, try not to take if, when people troll you try not to take it to heart um, like it, it does happen and it's it's not cool um, but it does happen so I think it's so weird I'd, I'd never been trolled on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook before and then I got to TikTok and it just happens every single post. So it's kind of a different attitude toward trolling here. It's it's more per permitted, I guess. So say so just just try to uh, not take it so seriously, and it's easier said than done. But you can always block people. Um, yeah. How large will the painting be? It'll be 40 by 30. Yeah, report them. Um, yeah, I, I mean, sometimes I, I, I would. I haven't reported anyone yet. I think if somebody used a uh, racist or homophobic or, uh, yeah, just like, just that kind of hate speech, uh, I would probably report those. But, um, you know, if it's, if it's a kid, there are a lot of kids, then it, it's it's a little bit hard to tell. Like I kind of think about it in terms of when I was a kid doing prank calls, you know, phoning people up and doing like it's sometimes it's it's kind of like that. Um, it's just different technology, but it's the same kind of they're just going for that kind of reaction. So if that's if that's what it is, if I can kind of. Uh, 
Maybe I click on their account and see that, that oh, yeah, that's obviously what's going on here. Then, yeah, I, that's fine. There's a certain amount of um, allowance, I think, that I would give. But you're right, it's, um, it just depends what kind of lines they, they want to cross. Generally speaking, that's a pretty, pretty good place. I certainly receive a lot more positivity than negativity, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, these are all paints. Um, no, I look at a picture before I paint, and then I draw it out, and then I just basically color it in after that. So... I'm just trying to put the teeth in now um, I don't know how many one two three four five to leave some space. I guess I should, I should think about the shapes of these teeth. So let's say that's the front tooth here. And that's missing. So this one will be twenty two. This will be the incisor. And this one, I don't know what's, what it's called, but semi-molar, something like that. Uh, yeah, this is canvas. Yeah, for sure. Um, how can art get hate? Yeah, it does. It sure does. Um, Olivia, thank you so much. Jace, staying updated. Thank you. Thanks very much. I appreciate that. Velez. Thank you. Deborah Dubes, yeah, this is a canvas. I have painted it with black gesso. It's a black gesso as a primer. Yeah. Infinite pile premolar. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Premolar.
what did I use for the white grid lines? Um, I used a white pencil crayon, colored pencil. It's, uh, looks like this. Say um, this one is well, blanc means uh, white. I'm, I'm from Canada, so we have everything, everything in both both uh, official languages. But uh, this is a Prismacolor Premier. I like using it because it's hard enough um, that uh, it doesn't smear and I can paint over it and the white from the ink is not going to come off onto the paint. So yeah, it's pretty great for that. It's just something I've been doing for uh, quite a while. Am I related to whom? Very talented, thank you, Chris. Hey, thanks, thanks so much, Tony. Appreciate that. Do I do private work for clients? Do I do commissions sometimes? Sometimes I do commissions. This is for a show though, this is for a gallery show. Gonna darken that up a little bit on the side here. You've only used acrylic paints as well, easier to blend. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's basically why people who switch from acrylic to oil never go back to acrylic. The blending is, is night and day. Like you can add a whole bunch of drying um, agent to acrylic to try to get it to um, act like oil paint. But uh, yeah, the, the blending feature is hugely, hugely important in oil paint. You know, and that's why it takes a long time to dry. So with acrylic, you're talking about drying time in terms of 
minutes or hours. But with oil paint, you're looking at um, hours to days. And if you put it on thick, even weeks. But yeah, it really makes a difference for sure. You can uh, add something to oil paint to hasten the drying time. It's called Alkid. But uh, I, I don't know why you'd want to take away the thing that makes oil special. So, yeah, I, I don't use that. I don't use any Alkid. If I'm in a rush, I, you know, well, I try not to be in a rush. But uh, I guess I could. I could use Alkid if I needed to. Um, oh, thank you so much, Jean. Yeah, so I'm just gonna back up and show uh, show everyone what what we have on the canvas right now. It's a pretty big canvas, um, so it's 40 inches. I have nothing on this side yet. We did this one um, yesterday, the live stream yesterday, and then. Uh, this globe, it's all glare right now, but there you go. So I did that globe this afternoon, during the live this afternoon. And then this one now. Oh, thanks so much for the roses. COVID lockdown crew. That's uh, very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm just gonna make this eye a little bit smaller here. on the other side I'm just gonna make this one a little bit bigger Okay, um, I think that might be a good spot to leave it for tonight. It's uh, yeah, just gone 11 where I am in Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, once again, if any of you are interested in picking up a print I have 34 different prints, I think it is, 34, 32 different prints available, all my own paintings, and um, 
uh, they are the prints are the same size as the paintings so that's kind of cool and um, they're not thousands of dollars they are they start at 25 bucks and um, most of them are 25 or 40 bucks I think they're like two or three really big ones and those are 60 but um, yeah if you are interested please do check out my store uh, it's only been up for five days and it's uh, there's a link in the bio in my bio here or you could go to Mark Liam Smith um, markliamsmith.com slash shop so I uh, appreciate any support you guys uh, can give me yeah much appreciated With that, I am going to sign off for the evening. Thank you uh, all very much for sharing and liking. And um, Annette Bigham, thank you for joining in your first live. Really do appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for checking out the store. Thank you for the fingers. Um, can I do a quick recap? Yeah, for sure. So um, yesterday's live, we did this. Kind of, um, I don't even know what you call it. Maybe it's maybe it's a teapot. I'm not totally sure, but uh, you know, I'll just pull right back. So this whole thing is going to be a big table, and there's just going to be everything on there, skulls, and I mean that's a plate of oysters. There's going to be lobsters and, and fruit everywhere, fruit baskets everywhere, uh, all kinds of things. And then um, in this afternoon's live, I painted this. Kind of wooden, I guess, wooden globe. And uh, in tonight's live, we did the uh, this pot here and the skull. So yeah, that's it. it yeah, it's it's pretty big. It's forty. Each of these squares is an inch, so um, forty inches by thirty inches. It'll be. Uh, It'll be a big one for sure. That skull is kind of um, pretty close to actual size. So, uh, All right. Thank you all again so very much for joining. Uh, it really is appreciated every time um, you, you join me on these lives and uh, stick around for any number of, of uh, minutes. And uh, particular, particularly, I'd like to thank um, those people who have joined me multiple times. And uh, with that, I bid you a happy Friday if you haven't already started it wherever you are in the world. See you in the next one, folks.